Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. A call, call, call. Conversations are called time. Conversations are called call, time. Conversations are called time. Conversations are called time. Conversations are called time. Conversations are called call, time. Conversations are called time. Conversations are called call, time. Conversations are called time. Conversations are called call, time. My name is Vivian Crawford. Welcome to Conversations Across Time. Seated next to me to my left is my co-host, former Pennsylvania State Representative Babette Joseph. Welcome, Babby. Thank you so much. I am so happy you're here. And, and I'm so much to the left. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. You're on the right side. Conversations. Uh, the left side. The left side. Conversations Across Time is the television show that seeks to uh, engage you in the fascinating study of history. What conversations could happen if historical figures from differing time periods could engage in conversation. What would they say? What would the discussions be? What would they say about today's issues? Um, how did the history makers think? What made them tick? What would they say if they lived today and what's going on? So joining us for what will be the second part of a very lively conversation, and uh, we're picking up where we left off, we seated to my right is Comrade Karl Marx. Thank you. Thank you for addressing me as comrade this week. Yes. <laughs> Once again, seated next to Comrade Marx is, is Queen Marie Antoinette. It is lovely to be here again. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, seated next to Queen Antoinette is one of my favorite persons from history, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Welcome, President. Vote for me again, please. Yes. Yes, of course. <laughs> So the, when, when we left, um, the la actually, we had to continue our conversation for two parts, so which is why we are all here. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't get to leave. We had to stay because the conversation was so heated. And um, I'm, I'm happy that we're going to be able to tie up at least, or at least answer some questions. Now, when we broke, we were talking about income disparity. We were also... I have a question of you, President Roosevelt, that, that is something I've always wanted to know. And that is, were, did you really believe in all of the things that you said about the forgotten man and about the downtrodden? Or, or were you, as the son of a capitalist and a capitalist yourself, did you just recognize that something needed to be done because income disparity and the income inequality that was existing at the time that you came into office was something that should not and could not be sustained? Well, maybe it, I think it was a little bit of both. Okay. It, was it would be impossible to do a, a vegetable soup without all the vegetables. And that's what was going on in our country. We had very, very big disparities, in not just in income, but in education, primarily, and even in medicine. We, uh, we had so many people that were uh, considered second-class citizens, and up until I became in, o in office, that was including women, uh, that w the country was going in a, in a very bad road, and it was getting muddy and sloppy, and we were going to wind up in, in much the same way as some of the third world countries. We were going to be overweight, and overweight in terms of income disparity, mm -hmm. in terms of technological things, in terms of our percentage of college graduates, even our percentage of high school graduates. And it changed, it, it changed the world because of the way I felt. 
I felt that we have to bring everyone in because we could only make ourselves stronger. The problem I had is that in many cases I had bills on the, presented to Congress mm -hmm. that Congress wouldn't even look at. They wouldn't take them out of committee. And that would have helped us greatly and perhaps would have put isn't us that, another Isn't that highway. sort of like what's going on today? Well, Congress is completely dysfunctional today. Well, you're talking about now. Now? It was, it was almost dysfunctional. Well, 1929, Congress, we had the Democratic Congress. Mm -hmm. And even the Democrats were opposed to many of the things that we wanted to do. And when the Republicans came in to the Congress, nothing got done. And if it wasn't for the fact that the Japanese attacked us, God knows where we would have been today. I, but I, I want to ask this, because one of the things, when we talk about your history, we talk so much about the fact that um, you were so, so important in having child labor laws put in place. I mean, because up until the time you were president, children were actually taken out of school so that they could work in the factories because their families needed them to work. Um, so child labor, uh, Social Security. All of which were opposed by yes. Congress. Yes. I had a fight for those things, yes. and I fought for those because I believed in them. Very, it's going to very end civilization. Mr. Mr. President, you didn't feel any threat from the people that were adherents to my philosophy. You didn't feel any threat that there was a potential for a revolution in this country by my followers. You're saying to me and this panel and to our television audience that you did this because of uh, compassion. You didn't feel any threat. You didn't do it to counter the threat of my uh, people and the revolution. You, I'm sure you're well aware that membership in the Communist Party increased uh, tremendously in the early years of your administration. There were more people joining the movement than ever before. So you didn't feel threatened by that? Well, I didn't feel threatened by it, but I recognized the fact that there was danger in it. Let me, let me, I, no, I, when you say that, let's bring it to today. Why do you suppose there's not this, there's not a, there's not a uprising of people who believe in, 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 in Comrade Marx's theories today? You said that you realized that it was going on when you were in the presidency. Do you have any, any notion as to why we don't, I mean, because we don't hear anything about well, communists meeting and deciding true, to. But we have something called Occupy. Okay. You know, and we have <laughs> young people now voting in overwhelming numbers compared so to. So is that the revolution? Well, I'm, I'm just it asking. Doesn't get worse. Part of the problem is that people who would be part of the movement are diverted into other activities. For example, okay. the uh, Islamic State mm -hmm. recruits a lot of underprivileged and poor uh, people that want to fight for it. These people who, for religion, go and fight for ISIS could very well, because of the economic depravity in their community, be members of a economic deprivation, movement. Deprivation, you mean? Yes, Not deprivation. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> and they could be members of a movement that would move the co the countries in the well, world, Great Britain, economically toward equality. So they're diverted to this religious movement. We also have uh, ways of diverting because of the mass media uh, the the attention of the people towards the real problems. Are, so, are, are they not, because my, my question would be, are they even aware of the real problems? It, it, it's, it always strikes me that so many people that I speak with have no clue. They just, they just don't know what's going on. I, well, not everyone can be president, number one. Okay. Number two <laughs> is that we have met the enemy. And, and yes. 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 That's number two. Yes. Number three is that we have such a lack of cooperative spirit within the country, mm -hmm. and much of it is that's as much as is fueled by the media, which was didn't exist to the uh, degree that I was when I was okay. president. Okay, so that, that's, that's, a, that's, that's a that's a big a lot of it is fueled by that that we but, would but, never but, see or would have heard of at any other time, but now. Mm -hmm. But but uh, below, if you want to see government up here. 
people are cooperating and doing all kinds of things. Communities are becoming sustainable. But that, right? Right, but people not are enough. Doing food. And it's in, it's only in no, certain, it's not it's enough. only in certain areas in the country. I agree. It is not a countrywide thing, I agree. which we I could agree. have farmed out to make but it a worldwide thing. But if we had thing. some sort of a response right. of government, it could be. It, when you can't feed the people in Africa or mm -hmm. Asia. Are our own governments mm -hmm. are starving them? That's what's driving us to oblivion. I mean, this is, and unfortunately, the only thing that's saving us right now is the new inventions, and hopefully that we have smarter people come in who are more aware people and who are more smart. willing mm -hmm. to give of themselves, which nobody seems but, to be well, doing but now. But I was going to say when we were talking about how people are recruited to the Middle East to engage in mm -hmm. violence and, and war. It's all about the, money. The countries, well, not for them. There yes, it are is. So a lot of I it think. is. It's all fueled but, by the income. But the people from whose countries these folks come are very alarmed because they think when they're finished in the Middle East and they've learned how to use these weapons and they've learned about war tactics, they're going to come back to Western Europe. They're going to come back to, to us, and they're going people, to use people them People who us. are desperate look for ways to Obviously. get out of their... So what you try and do is keep people from well, becoming so in desperate. Well, so in this case, religion fuels their uh, hatred and their... Uh, uh, right, like... But Comrade Marx, there's something interesting... So, but remember, I said religion is the opiate yes, of the you did. people. So yes. by having religion and fueling ah. this religious belief, it diverts them from but, their but economic... But these are cases who use religion as a... But, as a, as but, a but what I want to just... It's here's something that's interesting to me. It's a, I just, a I just... Well, it's an excuse. I just learned that's recently that ISIS, which, of course gets money from what? From the oil. Oil. The, from, yeah. from oil. So, from so, us. How yeah, about and, and so, exactly. So here we are with our so love horrible. for oil and our love for our fuel-injected cars and whatever. ISIS is able to make money because they sell oil. And we buy it. And we buy it. They're capitalists and just like we're capitalists. Exactly, because here's what they do. They pay the underprivileged. This is, this is something that I just found out. They actually, they go to these various villages with these poor people, and they pay them, uh, what is it, $600 a month, I think, is a stipend. Now, if you're someone that's poor and you can't feed your family, and along comes someone that's going to pay you $600 a month, which oh, I'm that's sure... that's a lot of money over there. That's exactly. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. A lot of money over there. So my, my problem is that, that as, yeah, they might, there might be some of them that are led by this religious zeal, but they're also led by the fact that they're getting paid well, and they're mostly. able to... Yes. I, I, think, I think that people use religion as a, as a crutch, as mm -hmm. an excuse. You know, there is a, a bazillion, bazillion, millions and bazillions of Muslims who are, are completely everyday yes. citizens working away trying to get by like the rest of us. That's true of Christians. And then you have a bunch of them that attack women's health facilities yeah. saying they're saving unborn babies. We're Christians and we're doing that. Well, most Christians think that's horrible. Most Christians mm -hmm. every single day are just trying to get by like everybody else. So the $600 a month stipend, as you can see, of course ISIS is spreading because what they're doing is they're able to pay people to be part of their madness. And now, why aren't we doing that? Right. That's what they're, I don't understand. And that we, why don't we go into every poor village in the Middle East and give them $600? Why don't we do I it here? Why don't we do it here? Thank you. Why don't we do it here? That's exactly that's exactly what I was, I was driving at because one of the things. One of the things that you, President Roosevelt, saw, first of all, this country, everyone can say the infrastructure is destroyed. So you've got all these poor people. When you look at what happens in Ferguson, what happens in Baltimore, there are bridges that need to be fixed. There are I roads that need to be fixed. Vivian, I'm I sorry. I just want to say that if I could go back in time, yes. now that I've seen history and how it repeats itself, I wish I would have done more for my people. Bring all these issues to light. I wish I would have done more. Well, you helped with our revolution. But I could have done more. And now seeing where all this has taken us to today's conversation, mm -hmm. 
You know, there's so much more I could have done. Do you would, think? Would you have given up your privilege and your money and your gambling and putting the French people and in debt to improve the life of the French peasants which and the French miserable. working class? But, but, would you have been willing to sacrifice your own personal comforts? Capitalists don't. I think there's some kind of compromise that could have been don't. made that I could have helped my people so much more than what, what I did. Because I'm but asking. Preserve your own head. That's the only reason. But you were a product of your not, time. That's good and motivation. That's really no, that's, that's, that's with that. That, that, yeah, that, exactly. There's nothing wrong with that because there are, as I, when I was talking about infrastructure, you were so young when you got into that position. And I think you were surrounded by people who were members, who were aristocracy, who had disdain mm -hmm. for the French people. So naturally, you're surrounded by people well, who- Well, she was also- awesome. And, and I really didn't have yeah, anybody exactly. that I knew going into the society that I was. It mm -hmm. was like, you know, you're around these group of people that say that you're friends, and they all act a certain way, all do things a certain way, and you start to become a part of that. And you start sure. to think that that's normal. And that's right. the kind of lifestyle that I live. Because but now President Roosevelt came from a privileged background. Mm -hmm. But he had, he had in some essence. And an education. Exactly. Well, people I that still question with his that motivation. I believe he, feel, he felt a tremendous threat to this country in terms from communism. of a revolution mm -hmm. based on right. my theory. He was able to see. And, and he was able to get Congress through hard work on his part, some great advisors to pass legislation that Treat stem the tide. Take, take the steam off. Ta yes. Right. And uh, of course, another panelist so no you had to pass, Lyndon Johnson, did the same thing. Exactly. Mm. But in answer to one of your questions, Ms. Crawford, the fact is that what the power structure, the capitalist class, the bourgeoisie do is divide the people based on race. Mm -hmm. Or based anything. on religion, or ethnic group, or uh, or income, or, or education, well, but yeah, or but anything. Even the poor people, the poor uh, people who are policemen, are pitted against the underprivileged uh, people in the black community who are uh, out of work, yes, unemployment, and Ferguson's out. These people should be having common. If they saw what I'm talking about, they would unite they have more in common. If you put a piece of bread in front of two underprivileged groups and it's a small piece of bread, they would fight over that small piece of bread among themselves instead of walking up to her palace and attacking well, Carol, well, or instead of walking up to Hyde Park and mm -hmm. attacking Kim. And as long as so they you're control saying that's the what's media, the newspapers, they divide and conquer. That, so that's that. So and that's, 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 that's the function. Now. That's the function of the media now. They are keeping because I, I I agree with you when you look at the incidents that happened in Ferguson and that happened in Baltimore. I, I, and, I, I and say to myself, you, you and yeah, and lots of other cities, that the police are. In Ferguson, it was particularly horrendous to me because I saw that that young man on the top of a tank, and he you know with sniper position. And I thought, the people that are out there demonstrating, well, that's you. I mean, they may not be the same color as you. Well, but, but they are. And mm -hmm. I am confounded. I'm confused by people who say to me, but there's black police officers acting that way. That has nothing to do with it. Structural racism, mm -hmm. which is what many in our government promote, has nothing to do with the race of the individual who is acting. That's why it's structural. That's why it's institutional. But it's not, excuse me, Babette, it's not that we promote it. It's the newspapers and the media are selling papers and advertising. They time. sensationalize. And that's it. what's feeding the frenzy. It isn't mm -hmm. the fact that we well, whites Donald hate blacks Wolf and blacks was up hate the whites. Other day it's, it's talking about early childhood education. Well, that's right. And it begins, we had all it kinds begins of in kindergarten. Law enforcement people, DAs police officers, and they were all saying, you want to prevent crime? Put money into education, right? The, the media wrote about that. They wrote about it? Yes, that's yeah. how I know well, about it. Well, they must have written it in language. But no even the no, education no, system in, in, in this country especially 
is a function of the economic capitalistic system. Yes. This gentleman was homeschooled with tutors, went to the best private mm -hmm. school in our country, uh, Groton, I believe, yes. is where you now attended. I say that right. was the best, but, okay. but 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 I mean, it's, it's but, rumored. <laughs> right, and he had a privileged education. The, the poor kid in the ghettos in in, mm -hmm. in Philadelphia right, or New York, or they're not getting side. anywhere near that education. They're and getting the, jobs. The, these capitalists that say, "Well, we deserve." what we got because we're smarter using social Darwinism. <laughs> smarter they're not, country. they're starting at a much higher plane. His right. father was wealthy. They were the aristocracy. The Roosevelt family was wealthy. They're starting way ahead of everybody else. And until, until you to deal with the inequality Look, But I didn't buy into it, Carl. The inequality Mar in the Karl workplace. Karl Marx was pretty middle class. That's, I was middle class. Yeah, I was middle go. class, but, but <laughs> I, I analyzed the problems <laughs> of <laughs> capitalism, and I, and I didn't uh, put I'm a Band-Aid on it. I, I, I didn't say, let's stem the tide. I said, I said let's change everything so, so there's total equality. So let me ask this. For where we are now in this country, would you think that revolution is what is needed? Yes. Or is it inevitable? I it's mean, it's inevitable. I believe it's inevitable. It will come. There's no protection. Now, they may not cut off people's heads, but they'll burn their houses down. Those rich uh, bourgeois that live in the uh, gated communities in the suburbs, they're not safe. They will go the same way she did, the same way that the Tsarina in uh, Russia, Russia did during the revolution, the same way wow. Nicholas did. Eventually, they will all die because they do not understand that we need a change and not just band-aids. They don't understand that when so, people have nothing to lose, they be Exactly. Well, the well that's what, that's, if I will give Mr. Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, I'm sorry, his due, he did understand that and he did. Right. But, is there, he but here's the problem, to lose. and this is what I always say, there is not on the horizon, I've not seen anyone of the ilk of President Roosevelt President Johnson or President Lincoln. And the reason that I cite those three is because those gentlemen, those presidents were very smart and they could look and they could look out on the landscape and recognize what was going on. You cannot have income disparity and have it be and, and have people suffer the way that people were suffering then, the way that people are suffering now, and not do something. So when I asked you earlier, I really, the, the, the answer to the question, no matter how you answered it, it would have been okay as to whether or not you actually believed in what you were doing and did it from your heart or you did it because you were smart. Because guess what? I don't see any smart politician out there right now who gets it. I see that we have a Congress in place that is completely, completely, they're owned by corporate interests and they have no idea of just how bad it is for other folks. Vivian. I have to tell you, I want, and I want to put a head on this thing. Mm -hmm. We have the best Congress that money could buy. Right. <laughs> and that's exactly that's right. what it, it's about. That's true. We, don't, we, we no longer, sitting at this table, have a voice that's in right. what's happening in our country. I agree. We, we have to accept what we're given, and everyone has to, because that's what we're given. Mm -hmm. And if you don't take it, you shame on you. President Roosevelt, you were a Democrat. I'm sure you will agree with this statement. I was a Republican first. Well, your family were Republicans. They yeah, were, they well, were the two raised at Roosevelt's. But anyway, the, the, the thing I would ask you right now, you just uh, quoted, uh, I guess it was Will Rogers or somebody, but it is the best Congress money can buy. Right. But they buy Democrats today as well as Yes. I, I'm yes, not, I wasn't saying, I didn't. Yeah, you, you didn't, didn't, you, you, didn't, you didn't say I, that. There was no distinction in my okay, mind. I just yeah. Was, yeah. What there is. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, and that, and that's it, I, isn't that sad? That's a sad commentary on this well, country. Well, it's, it's what he said that's sadder, is that we are heading on a road, on a highway to oblivion. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what we are. We're, we're suffering every day, and we're yeah. losing inch by inch by well, inch. Well, we're losing the middle class, and we're, you well, don't have a democracy. That's what we're talking about. We're you losing, don't have a middle class. Well, we don't have the intellectual people, because we're not, we're not grad, our high school graduations are the lowest in our history, and the most expensive. And that's what's going to be, was feeding this well, country originally is when everybody was had to learn, had a yes for learning, well, and which and was taken away from them. Mm -hmm. because the frontier they can't, is they have either to go figuratively to work. or the real frontier always gave people opportunities. 
And there's not any of that left Because now. we're not funding it. That's ex Congress right. is not funding the things that are necessary for everybody to exist. And, and, middle for, class us to, and, and for us to compete I, There's no middle class. <coughs> no, and I agree with you, President <coughs> Roosevelt. One of the things that I wanted to talk about, and I, I I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask if, if, if um, because believe it or not, we're close to the end, of, and we went, we, we're close to the end of this episode. I want to ask if you will come back, because I really would like us to have a conversation about infrastructure. I, I, I don't, you know, we sort of talked about it a little bit, but I, I just don't get why Congress is not doing something about this mass of people who don't have jobs. We have things that need to be done, and we have the wherewithal to do it. But, but we'll talk about that when we come back, because quite frankly, we, we, we are just at the end of our time, and we haven't had a chance to get there. Keep ginning up the war machine. Yeah, yeah, and that, and that I think just to, to Comrade Marx, to your point, uh, wars. That's 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 that that's what keeps this country going. But the interesting thing, and I'd like you to think about this and come back so that we can discuss it. And that is, we've been involved in two wars right now. One for ten over ten years, and it's done nothing to help what's going on with the economy or help to or help the people that are having those wars. It's it, worse. Exactly, exactly. So I, I mean, I, I, I want us to have that conversation because I'm wondering the victims if- victims are civilians, all people, women and children. Yeah, that's true. And, yeah, and, and I'm wondering, and, 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 and Queen, I, I, I think when we, when we talk about war and we talk about revolution, you would have some interesting ideas about things that happened just before. So what, what I'd like us to do is, Come back and take this topic up again. And, I, and I'm, I'm sorry, we just, there's so much for us to talk about. There is. And so I, I, I just want to ask you, invite you back, if you will, and we will continue this conversation. So on behalf of Babette and myself and the entire Conversations Across Time crew, we want to thank our guests tonight, uh, express our gratitude for their insights, and we also want you to come back so that we can finish this interesting conversation across time. Thank you. This has been Conversations Across Time. Good night. Conversations Across Time. 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 Conversations Across Across Time. Conversations Across Time. Conversations Across Across Time. Conversations Across Time. Conversations Across Across Time. Conversations Across Time. Conversations to call time. Conversations to call time. Conversations to call call time. Conversations to call time. A call call time. Conversations to call time. Conversations to call call time. Conversations to call time. Conversations to call call time. Conversations to call time. Conversations to call call time. Conversations of all time, conversations of all time, conversations of all time, conversations of all time.